Hello, and welcome to another episode of PDA Dad UK. In this week's episode, what I want to discuss is meltdowns. And in previous episodes, I have discussed meltdowns from the perspective of understanding why they occur, what the processes are that go on in an autistic person's brain that lead to meltdowns occurring. With this, I want to look at it from the perspective of what can we do to A, avoid meltdowns, but B, when a meltdown's occurring, how do we cope with it the best? How can we best support our kids in the process of having a meltdown to bring them out of it sooner uh, and to recover from it once it's happened? I'm discussing this from the perspective of a bloke who fails at this constantly. <laughs> um, and I'll go into explaining why I fail so <laughs> frequently with it. Um, but meltdowns are challenging. Uh, when they're occurring, it's hard not to take them personally, especially if you're dealing with a PDA child like my daughter. They can seem very directed and they can seem very focused on you and they often are accompanied by quite extreme violence and certainly a lot of very undesirable behaviours that lead you to a point of frustration. And for me, anger, I, I really feel it. Um, someone hits me in the face, I'm instantly going to be annoyed about it. Um, and when my daughter does it, I've found to my dismay that I feel the same. It's like a reaction of what the heck did you just do? Um, responding appropriately in that moment is what's important. And um, how we can reach our kids in these points of meltdown is really what I want to focus on and how we can make them feel supported and loved before, during and after the meltdown. So I want to start with the before and it's a really important facet of examining this as an issue. I've learnt over time and it's taken a long time to predict when a meltdown is going to occur. You can do it in some situations. There are other situations where it's in the snap of a finger and she's off. And they're, they're probably the hardest to deal with because it's just bang. But I've learned to observe warning signs with my daughter that allow me to step in before a meltdown's occurred and hopefully bring it back down. And it's only recently I've learned a lot of this stuff. Um, and, and it's through reading and through researching and um, coming to understand what's going on for her. <sighs> My daughter has a specific set of giveaways for when a meltdown's coming. So what we call triggers, things that you can see that are early warning signs that a meltdown's imminent. Sometimes they are predictable because you can see she's in a frame of mind. My daughter gets a very specific look on her face when she's going to kick off. And this has been an important thing in learning the difference between probably a tantrum and a meltdown. So a tantrum is when a behavior is enacted because they want to see a result at the end. So my daughter might want to have chocolate. She might want to have her tablet. She might want to do something. And we've said, not at the moment. We can't do it right now. We've got this to do. And that look comes on. And you can see what we're heading into is a tantrum. And it's a manipulative meltdown, if you like. So she knows that if she behaves a certain way, we're more likely to cave in to avoid the meltdown. And so it can trigger her into it. The problem is once she's in that frame of mind, it can then trigger into a meltdown because she, it, something happens in the, the setup. Uh, I think the anxiety is triggered. And it's, it's almost an excitement to know that she's hopefully going to get something at the end of it and that's what the focus becomes and that's what pathological demand avoidance really is if they want to be in control she has a goal and if we're in the way of that it leads to the problematic behaviors and actions in the process of that the way I've used to describe it is a way that was described to me by a doctor that my daughter saw who used the Star Trek analogy and um, I won't go into massive detail on it because we've discussed it in previous episodes. Please do go and have a look at those. Um, but uh, basically you've got three parts to the brain. The forefront of the brain is Spock. And Spock is your logic, pure mathematical, uh, analytical, logical processing. 
the center of the brain is Kirk and Kirk's your emotional response. So all feelings and um, yep, emotions. And at the back of the brain, we've got the lizard and the lizard's your basic instincts. So your fight, flight or freeze, eat, sleep, procreate, all those sort of things are, are backed up. When uh, an autistic child in particular is heading into a meltdown, Spock goes for a walk and all you've got is Kirk and the lizard communicating. So you've got an emotional response and fight, flight or freeze. And for my daughter, it's fight. <laughs> it's never gonna be freeze and she certainly doesn't run away from the problem. She comes at it head on. Different kids will have different responses and freeze is where you'd head into a, a shutdown, which is a sort of other side of the coin to a meltdown. And again, we've discussed that in a previous episode in the interview I did with Amanda Hall. So with a meltdown, they're gonna hit the fight. And a meltdown is that absolute loss of control because all you've got is emotion and instinct kicking in. And what you need to do is try and re-engage Spock. You need to bring him back into the picture. And that's the process. When you're in a meltdown, when it's already occurring, that's impossible. You're not gonna get it back until the, there's been a calming and then you can re-engage. But I've noticed that when I see the telltale signs in my daughter, when I see certain facial expressions, certain babies, she might start getting a bit fidgety, running around, making a lot of noise. She sings a lot at the moment. It's, it's picking up things, it's actually stimming. So again, in a previous episode, we've looked at stimming. When I see certain stimming behaviors from my daughter, I know that the anxiety is peaking and they're a really good indicator for me to say, we're heading down a bad path and I've got maybe two minutes to deal with this. And so what I try and do at that stage is re-engage Spock. And I've done this through a lot of trial and error. I've made many, many mistakes in doing this, trying to find the right way to do it. And for me, it's talking to her and explaining, hey, 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 you're in control right now. So I'm playing into the pathological demand avoidance there. So you, an innate part of PDA is the desire to be in control or the need to be in control. It's not even a desire. It's a need that's, that's set in. So by saying to my daughter, oh, you're in control right now. What's your options and what's the best thing to do? And we've established there are certain things that she can do that help calm her. One of the things I found is these, they're, they're called visualizations. It's like a, not a story, but almost like a, just imagine yourself here. It's a calming place. Um, it could be a, a zoo or it could be a beach, something like that. And it, it just goes into the details. And she really, really, really gets on with them. Uh, to, to my surprise, I thought when I was given them by one of her teachers or actually her play therapist, I was like, oh, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> but I, you know, I'll give anything a go if it's going to help. And I've been really surprised at how well they've worked. Um, so we can do that. But what it is basically is saying, you're in control right now. You need, and I, what I'm doing there is I'm engaging logic. So I'm actually bringing logic into the picture. So what you've got right now is a situation where you're going to head into either a meltdown and, and, and get into trouble and hurt someone or yourself, or we can take control of this and you're in control of your actions. What can we do to prevent getting into that headspace? And it doesn't always work. And that's because often the desire is there. And this is again, plays into the manipulative meltdown versus the um, actual meltdown. But when it is in that situation, if she can then stop and think, it's re-engaging logic and it, it re-engages that process. It doesn't bring a right down and we have to have to do it a few times. Well, 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 you're heading back into that. What can we do? And she might want to go out and jump on the trampoline. She might want to have a, one of these visualizations read to her. She might want to chill on a chair and just watch some YouTube videos on the telly. She, various things that she likes that will help bring that anxiety back down. And that's the thing to keep in mind. Meltdowns are all about anxiety. It's when anxiety is peaked. And we've looked at the Coke bottle effect in, in, in relation to masking, but it's, it's a similar thing, is that when you're heading into a meltdown, that bottle's being shaken really, really fast. And you need to stop it before it's gonna explode because once you shake it too much, you know, it's like adding stuffing Mentos into it. <laughs> it's just going to really explode. You need to somehow prevent that and stop the shaking, bring it back to, so that the bottle can rest and settle before it explodes. 
So it's, it's about avoiding getting to the point where that shaking has already started. It's to stop the shaking and bring it back down to a, a level that they can engage logic, engage that part of the brain that says, I'm in control, or for my daughter at least, I'm in control. And it plays into that PDA, as I say, but it gives that sense of, I'm in control here, but it's also achieving her calming and hopefully not heading into a meltdown. When you head into a meltdown, it's a very different situation. And there are a number of things that you can do once you're in that situation. So that's what I wanna look at next. Once you're hitting a meltdown, what can you do to make the process as brief and as non-destructive and calming and, and helpful for, for, for the kid um, in that situation? How can we help them through it in the best, most positive way? So the first thing when your child has already gone into meltdown that you can do is be empathetic. And again, this is something I can struggle with because when you've got a child being violent and aggressive and swearing at you and calling you every name under the sun, <laughs> and my daughter's learned some very interesting phrases um, when they're being thrown at you, it, it's hard not to take it personally. I, that, I personally find that. Um, it's hard not to think, you know, she really hates me and to not take the insults and the aggression that's hurled at me really personally. But you kind of got to overcome that. We need to be empathetic. And it's, it's a very difficult thing to do in this situation. But if you can, it's almost like you're avoiding a meltdown yourself. You need to engage your logical um, processing in order to say what's really going on here. When a child's in meltdown, and it's a genuine meltdown, and they've hit that point where it's the explosion after all that shaking, they're going through turmoil. So they're, they're, they're really, really struggling. And it's really, really difficult for them because they can't break out of it. it it's a physical expression, if you like, of all that anxiety that's been building up and building up and has just exploded in whatever, whatever way they're having the meltdown. And, you know, when they're screaming and yelling at you and carrying on, it can be very hard to be able to step back and, and use that logical part of the brain. But it's so important to do, to be able to step back and say, hey, I need to be empathetic. What are they feeling? Why are they feeling this? And you've, you've probably got a series of situations that have occurred and that anxiety has been building up and that autism and anxiety is so in, intrinsically related. Um, you know, it, it is basically dealing with high anxiety and how that plays out. You need to show that understanding. And one of the things that I learned quite recently, I had to go through a training session for, for safe restraint. And the chap who was running it actually said there's some interesting things that take place is that you can think you're being really empathetic and you can use your resting face. So the resting face is just how I look right now. That can actually be interpreted as a real negative and it plays into they're disappointed, they're angry and increases those fears and anxieties and is likely to increase the re resulting behaviours in the meltdown that you're going to see. So actually being able to smile, you know, like, <laughs> almost like sticking a mask on, but being able to smile, hey, 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 I'm here for you. That facial expression is so important because that's that's what they're reading. They're probably not hearing the words, they'll hear the tone of voice, but they're really gonna see the expression on your face, how you're looking. And if you can be smiling and hey, 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 I'm here for you. It's okay, what can we do? And avoid that resting face. And I find it really hard to do because in that moment, I'm probably cross. I'm probably angry that this is happening again. I've probably been bitten, kicked, scratched, and things thrown at me and the last thing I want to do is you know smile through it but it can be the difference between antagonizing the meltdown and increasing its severity to bringing it back down so showing that I'm here for you I understand what you're going through I understand it's really difficult right now being able to do that can make a big difference in how the meltdown plays out and that really plays into the next part, which is make them feel safe and loved. 
and that's what they're looking for. So that facial expression really does matter in that because that's how they know I'm not unloved, I'm not, I don't need to fear anything right now. And you're their safe place. Um, there's a reason why kids, autistic kids, tend to mask in school and then get home and it all explodes. It's because at school they don't feel safe, so they bottle it all up. When they get home, it all explodes because that's their safe place. They know they are safe to be themselves and it all comes pouring out. Uh, it, it sounds really cheesy and it sounds very, uh, I don't know, zen and, and all that kind of stuff, but it, there's a real truth to it. And that is that love is 99% of being a successful parent, being a successful human being, in my opinion. But if your kids know they're loved and they know they're safe, it makes a huge difference. And in those moments, they need to know they're safe. They need to know they're loved. And again, that's just gonna help with the severity of the meltdown and hopefully bring it back to a calmer headspace more quickly. So, reflecting that love and I'm a big proponent of the five love languages this is a it, it, it's a religious concept but it's actually something that you know no matter what you believe I, be, I think really plays into life there are five different love languages and that can be um, time spent um, it, so sort of quality time it can be words of affirmation being told good things it can be gift giving so you know I know I'm loved because I'm receiving something from these people. It can be physical touch. And you know, these are ones that you, you've got to be careful with because physical touch could be the completely the wrong thing to do. It's something that you're going to know by knowing your child long enough and having seen what their love language is. And everyone has a primary love language. We all respond to them all in different ways. But the, the different love languages, um, you have a primary one. And a big difficulty a lot of people have is that I can think to myself, I'm, I'm showing my wife love because I like words of affirmation and I can tell her all the time, I love you, I think you're amazing. But uh, for her, her love language is quality time, her primary love language. So if I'm not spending quality time with her, she's not feeling that love from me. And it's the same for my daughter. She has certain things that she needs to feel love from me. For my daughter, gift giving is a big part of it. She's, she's quite, responsive to that she she recognizes that that's a, a gift yeah, my, i think my uh, mother-in-law is the same she's very uh, she constantly brings presents over and stuff like that that's the way that she shows her love being able to recognize how your child receives your love and recognizes it is really important so i really recommend looking at the five love languages and i think i'm probably going to do an episode soon focusing on those um, on the basis of you know how we can teach our kids uh, that we love them, how we can show it and reflect it in everyday life. But once you know uh, what your child's love language is, um, you can work with that. And um, words of affirmation are up there for my daughter. So like myself, I need to hear positive feedback. If, if I can talk to her and say, I'm, I'm really proud of you right now. She doesn't work on that as a reward so much, but it, it's, it's being able to reflect that, hey, I'm here for you and I'm always going to be here for you no matter what you do I'm here and that's something that we often talk about in the come down from the meltdown is you know what there's nothing you can do that's going to stop me loving you I will always always love you and she responds to that really well but being able to say those things in a meltdown can be a real difficulty if she's tearing up the joint telling me I she hates me and that I'm any one of a number of four letter words that she's learned from school um, it can be really difficult to be, hey, it's okay, I love you. It doesn't feel natural and I really, really struggle with it and I fail with it constantly. And it's something I'm really trying to work on in my own self in being able to talk to my daughter in those moments and say, hey, 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 I love you. Stop what you're doing because you're not helping right now. But I love you. I'm not going to stop loving you, but you need to put that down. You need to do whatever you need to do. What can we do to make this better for you right now and again that plays into the PDA and the, the, the controlling behaviours and the need to be in control that she has. It's really difficult <laughs> and as I say I fail constantly but it's something I'm working on and I want to be able to get to the point that when we're in these situations 
I can be uh, an Oscar winning actor and, and you know, put aside all of my frustration, anger, um, fed upness, whatever you want to call it, and just show her in that moment, you're loved. And that's not changing. Another thing to keep in mind is that punishments aren't likely to work. And again, this is something that I struggle with because my instant response is to, you know, right, that's it, you've lost your tablet for the night. Can you? That's needed at some level. Um, and what I'm learning slowly is that the better way to approach it is you're going to lose things if you carry on with this behavior. So it comes into those preliminary triggers and, and recognizing that a meltdown is imminent and being able to deal with the meltdown as, as before it occurs. One thing I've learned is that, yeah, it's not necessarily the punishment itself, but hey, look, you don't want to lose your tablet, do you? You don't want to lose your treats. So what can you do right now that's going to help you to avoid that situation? Um, it's so important to recognize that when a true meltdown's occurring, it's not something they can help. And it's, it's the hardest thing for other people to understand. It's the reason why it's so difficult when a meltdown happens in public, being able to sort of deal with other people and whatever else is going on because you're suddenly aware of what other people are thinking. But they can't help it. When my daughter's in a true meltdown, it's not something she's chosen to do. It's a physiological reaction to the anxiety and stress that's built up inside her over a period of time, and it's coming out. And it's it's really, as I say, it's difficult to deal with, but in, in removing the idea of punishments, it's not gonna help afterwards. It's not gonna have solved the fact that you had the meltdown. Um, it's it's going to exacerbate it and potentially bring it back. And that's one thing I have really learned with my daughter is that um, if I, I did it tonight, my, my daughter had a, a, a meltdown just she was she was going to bed and I handled it completely wrongly in so many ways. And, you know, at the time it's like, right, you've lost a tablet. And I was introducing all these things. And it, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't engaging my logical part of the brain, I was just reacting to the situation and reacting in the wrong way. Once I'd been able to step away and calm myself down and, and realise that's where I was going, I went back up and I read one of the visualisations and she was asleep in five minutes as I was reading the visualisation. Um, it didn't help the situation, in fact it exacerbated it. Once I'd said that, that's when things really kicked off. What I'd have been better doing is saying, you know, hey, you don't want to lose your tablet, do you? Let's, how can we control this right now? Um, it's it's difficult, it's really challenging. And as I say, I'm learning every single day how to handle this better. And hopefully what I can do is take these lessons and, you know, if we have a meltdown tomorrow or the next day or whenever it's going to happen next, I'll be able to put these things into practice. And hopefully for my daughter, that will make her life better. And I know it will make our, our lives collectively a lot easier. A big thing is when these meltdowns occur in public. And I've already looked at um, sort of dealing with that situation when you're out in public. More from, from both sides, from what you can do and what other people can do to, to be better. But at that point, when the meltdown's occurring, the best thing you can do is just ignore everything else going on around you and put your focus 100% on your child because your anxieties are going to be picked up on by your kids. They're very astute. They won't even be aware they're picking up on it, but it's being communicated. And if you can just focus on your kid, if you can focus on what's happening with them right now, it helps to eliminate the, the loss of logic because I find it m most challenging when it's in public because you're then dealing with other people's perceptions and then that stress comes into me and I handle things in the wrong way if I'm not careful. Uh, we, you know, I talked about in a previous episode, we had a really bad meltdown in the middle of the NASDA where you know, a pair of shoes weren't what she wanted, proper meltdown, throwing things around in the middle of a massive supermarket, everybody stopping to look and I had to sort of step in and stop her from hurting herself or anybody else and then get her outside 
And I remember thinking, you know, what does everyone think right now? And it didn't help that a, a chap came up to, to find out what was going on. And he meant it in the best way. Keep your focus on your kid and keep it on them. And don't worry about what other people are doing. Don't worry about what other people are thinking. All that matters is your child and helping them through the process of the lockdown so that they can calm down and they can get back to being themselves again. Something that can help for a lot of parents, it's, it's not so much for my daughter, but um, there are certain things that we do with this, but is to have a bit of a sensory toolkit available at all times. My daughter's very adept at this herself. She always carries a bag. <laughs> She's always got in there, you know, books and some a change of clothes. And um, she's always got a roll of toilet paper. And you're like, why? I tell you that toilet roll has come in useful more than once <laughs> in emergency situations. I've actually been known to ask now, do you have it with you? Because you know, what I've learned is that that's partly her way of, it, it's almost like a stim if you like, she's managing herself. So she needs to know that she's got certain things available to her if she starts getting over anxious and if her clothes get wet or dirty, she's got something there she can change into. She needs to know these things. Um, and we try and carry her tablet with us. Um, games like Minecraft and Roblox for her are really helpful. So they take a lot of focus. And if she's getting very anxious, playing a game like that focuses a lot of the brain because it's, you've got to think about what you're constructing and what you're defending and what's next in the game or you know uh, the obstacle courses in roadblocks are great because you've got to focus on how to get through them and it takes a lot of processing and funnily enough re-engages the logical part of the brain again we keep those things with us for many kids it could be that you need to have a, a weighted blanket that you keep in the car something that you can wrap them in uh, compression can be a really big thing for a, a lot of autistic kids so by wrapping them in something heavy it can give them that feeling of compression and help alleviate the anxiety it could be a chew toy something they just need to chew on uh, something soft that they like the feel of it could be you know, it could be any one of a number of things but you know your kid you know the things that help them having those with you can be a real benefit um, just something that you can go to and go, oh, all right, we're in this, here's what I can do. And again, it's going to show that love. So it comes back to the point about showing your child that they're loved and they're safe. What you're providing is evidence of that safety, evidence of that love that you have because you're providing for them in their moment of need. They can be really useful things. It's not always easy and it doesn't always work, but it's really handy to have there because there are situations where it really will help to bring that anxiety down and get you through to the karma and more themselves again. Then there's the aftermath. For me, it's, it's a really important part of, of whenever we've had a meltdown, I, I often feel really bad in myself. If I've had to, particularly if I've had to restrain, it physically intervene with my daughter somehow. And I have to do that because she could hurt other people. She gets very aggressive, things get broken, things get thrown, and I have to be able to keep everybody else safe and keep them protected. I hate doing it, and I've talked in previous videos how I hate doing that and how it makes me feel, the turmoil that I go through afterwards. But what I make a point of is always sitting with my daughter and having a talk to her about it. And it's almost like a debrief. Um, back, you know, when I was uh, working in an office, one of the big things was whenever we had a significant event or we did something special, if we were putting something together, we always had a debrief. And it was one of those really useful things. So I used to organize or be part of organizing business events. And one of the best parts was always afterwards looking at that and what could we have done better? What could we do differently? What really worked? What was good about it? So we focused on positives and we focused on negatives. So it's that sort of, uh, I don't know if you've heard of a SWOT analysis, but it's the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And you, you kind of go through it and it's a good system to use. Strength, what, was it, what did we handle right in that? And that can be something you process yourself. Did I handle this right? Did I handle that right? What did I do well in that situation? Was I calm? Was I loving? Did I use my resting face? And so that was misinterpreted. Was I cross? Did I overreact? 
you know, they're the weaknesses. So it's kind of, you know, they, they play into each other. So you can look at the good things you've done, then you look into your weaknesses, then you look into the opportunities. So what can we take from this? How can we use this to make it better next time? And I find this with my daughter really useful. When I can say to her, you know, we went through that and I, I sat with you beforehand, didn't I? And I said, we need to bring it back down. You were in control and you had a chance there to do something. What could you have done in that situation that would have helped? And she'll, she, she knows the answers in the sense that she knows what she needed. I should have sat down. I should have gone and jumped on the trampoline. I should have played on my tablet or just watched a video, whatever the situation was. She know it's good for her to reinforce in herself. That's what I should have done. And it's coming from her. And that's the great thing. When I'm talking to her about the opportunities, they come from her. I do my own personal one. What could I have done differently? So as I explained, we had this this evening and I, I reacted the wrong way and I, I, I went into punishment mode. It was the wrong thing to do. What I should have done was looked at the situation and try to put her in control, give her the sense of control in that situation, but also not elevate the anxiety by making threats, if you like. And that brings us to threat, which is what are the dangers? And, and I talk about this with her quite openly. It's like, if you do that, imagine if someone had got hurt, what would have happened? So this is why it's important to, at the beginning, when I'm saying to you, you're in control right now and you have the choice, you need to make these choices because if you hurt someone, you're gonna feel awful, they're gonna feel awful, and who knows what could happen. They're really important moments, and they, they're some of the closest moments I have with my daughter, funnily enough. It's, it's a really hard thing because you're a mess of emotions yourself, as I certainly am. But in that moment where it's like, hey, and, and this afternoon, it was only a few minutes, I came down to just step away from the situation I knew she was in a situation where she was calm enough that I could do that. Um, I left it five minutes and then went back up and, hey, come on, give me a cuddle. She gave me a cuddle. She said sorry. And then it was just being able to say, what can we do to help now? So how could we have done that differently? What was important there? But also it was a chance for me to say, well, I can do that with you now. And that's why we read through the, the visualization story thing that I've got. And it really helped. She was asleep within five minutes. I wish I'd done that at the beginning. And that's, again, that, that debriefing myself, knowing I should have handled the situation differently. When I'd seen it getting that, I should have just gone, hey, look, why don't we read one of these? Because I can see you getting upset. And that would have been a much better way to go. Meltdowns are inevitable. They're gonna happen for 99% of autistic kids. How we deal with them at the time can make the difference between a catastrophic meltdown and a meltdown that we bring through and we have a calmness afterwards. As I said before, I fail all the time. I make the wrong decisions and I react emotionally in the moment or whatever it may be. I'm learning too. We all are. And I'll be learning for the rest of my days with my daughter, I'm sure. Um, but I'd love to hear from you. If you've had any strategies that you found really work with meltdowns and how you cope with them, how you've learned to use triggers and stuff like that, please do chuck it in the comments. Um, please do like and subscribe and I will see you next time.